Today, we are going to talk about anxiety and panic-related disorders. To start off, what is anxiety? Anxiety is very similar to stress in the sense that there's a normal and an abnormal response to anxiety, as well as how it feels. So there are different degrees of anxiety that determines if you're having a normal or an abnormal response. And we usually rate this as mild, moderate, severe, or panic level anxiety, and that's based on the work of Hildegard Peplau. So a normal response to anxiety is an uncomfortable feeling of apprehension or dread that occurs in response to internal or external stimuli. So for example, emotionally, you may feel fear or apprehension. Physically, your body's going to go into the fight or flight response. So you may have an increased heart rate, increased breathing, increased muscle tone, relaxed GI system. Um, cognitively, you may be trying to decipher the situation. Um, so you may have increased focus. Um, you may also have the ability to figure out coping strategies. And behaviorally, we look at how one acts in response to the emotional, physical, or cognitive response. So when we have a normal response to anxiety, those behaviors are all going to be adaptive, just like when we talked about coping skills. Um, and that helps us to either mitigate the risk that we're getting into or overcome whatever obstacle is causing that anxiety. An abnormal response is when the fear experienced is out of control or out of proportion to what it should be. So for example, if somebody has anxiety, um, let's say they're working on their homework, um, it can cause anxiety normally, which would motivate you to study. Whereas in an abnormal response, if someone had that anxiety and it was out of proportion to the event, the anxiety of doing your homework would be so debilitating that the individual wouldn't be able to focus and they wouldn't be able to get the homework done. Um, with that, the anxiety does interfere with daily functioning when we have that abnormal response. And they may try coping or defense mechanisms, but they're often ineffective or they can be maladaptive. So when we look at anxiety, we know that it is the most common mental disorder experienced by individuals as well as treated. Um, we also know that it's chronic and persistent. So about 75% of those that are diagnosed with anxiety have had an episode of major anxiety by the time they're 21 and a half. We do know that anxiety often starts in childhood and it can often be diagnosed as separation anxiety disorder or selective mutism. It's also comorbid with medical diagnoses, especially when that medical diagnosis can be traumatic, terminal, or substance use is involved. Um, in older adults, as well as in children, anxiety can manifest somatically, meaning physical symptoms. So we see a lot of children will develop a headache or um, a stomach ache when they experience anxiety. With the older adult population, we also see those physical symptoms as well as depression-like symptoms. Um, anxiety can also look like Alzheimer's disease in the older adult population. If anxiety is left untreated, it can progress to suicidal thoughts, drug use, early parenthood, and educational underachievement. So when we look at how to assess anxiety, there's a lot of different things we wanna look at. First up, what type of anxiety is the individual experiencing? Are they experiencing mild anxiety, moderate, severe, panic level? Um, is that a normal or an abnormal response? So when we look at the different levels of anxiety, our mild anxiety is going to be what is healthy anxiety. So it's the anxiety that motivates us to do something. Moderate anxiety is a little bit out of proportion to what they should be experiencing given the trigger, but they don't necessarily need treatment for it. They're able to control that anxiety with coping skills. Severe anxiety is much more out of proportion to what they're experiencing, and it often requires medical intervention like an antidepressant or a benzodiazepine. And then the panic level anxiety is the most severe, and we'll actually talk about that in a little bit. So in addition to assessing the type of anxiety, we want to know the duration of anxiety. How long does it last? How many times a day do they experience it? What triggers the anxiety? 
Typically different things like different situations or topics, the weather, the time of year, the time of day um, can all impact a person's level of anxiety. We know that just like depressive symptoms can increase in the winter, a lot of times anxiety symptoms increase as well. Then we wanna assess how the patient copes or resolves their anxiety. Are their coping skills effective or does it negatively affect their health? We wanna look at the frequency of the anxiety. Do they take any medications for it, either prescribed or self-medicated? Do they have a family history of anxiety? We do know that there's a very, very strong genetic influence in anxiety. Do they have any comorbidities, especially those medical comorbidities that may threaten life, um, personal image, self-esteem? Um, is then anxiety affecting their sleep patterns? We do know that the less sleep you get, the more anxiety you have, but anxiety interferes with sleep, so it can lead to insomnia. We're going to assess if they've had any early life traumas. We're going to assess if they have panic attacks. If they do have panic attacks, we want to assess the duration of that panic attack. Typically, a panic attack will last between 5 and 30 minutes. We want to know the experience that they have with that panic attack. So a lot of times you get the physical symptoms of anxiety, but it becomes so severe that the individual starts to hyperventilate. In that hyperventilation, they're releasing too much CO2, so their gas, blood gas levels become unbalanced. That can lead to things like numbness and tingling in your hands and your feet, facial numbness, um, muscle tremors, and intense shaking. It's going to lead to increased panic because it feels like you're dying. You're going to have chest pain, um, stomach aches, maybe some dry heaving and vomiting. Um, in addition, they're going to feel almost like they have an outer body experience. So they'll feel like an overwhelming sense of doom and dread that's going to feel numbing and feel like they're about to die or something bad's going to happen, but it also sometimes feels like they're disconnected from their body. Um, and then ultimately, if we don't correct that acid base balance in the blood, what can happen is the individual can actually have what we call pseudo seizures and they can have seizure like activity. Um, so we're going to assess if they have any of those experiences or how they experience their panic attacks. We're going to assess for any triggers of the panic attacks and how it resolves. Are they able to intervene early to stop the panic attack or do they usually let it run its course? So we want to look at all those different things. In addition, we're going to assess their nutrition level. We do know that a balanced nutrition can help improve anxiety and that there's actually some foods that have anxiety reducing measures to them. So for example, nuts, avocados, chocolate, all release chemical substances that help to reduce anxiety. We're also going to assess their anxiety on a different scales. So there is the Hamilton anxiety scale, which is pretty common, and it goes through a series of questions to identify the individual's level of anxiety. We also typically in the hospital will just ask a patient on a scale of one to 10, with one being no anxiety and 10 being the most severe anxiety you've ever had in your life, how would you rate it? And then that gives us a measurement to see if treatment is effective. And then lastly, we're going to assess for any defense mechanisms that they may use in response to that anxiety. Treatment for anxiety is pretty straightforward. Um, we always wanna start off with an SSRI or an SNRI, so those antidepressants. This is our first line therapy, and we find that it's really effective in reducing anxiety and that depression and anxiety often go hand in hand. Um, so remember, these are medications like Celexa, Lexapro, Paxil, Zoloft, Prozac. Um, with these medications, we do have to titrate them to a higher dose until they're therapeutic. And we can't stop them abruptly because it can cause seizure and withdrawal um, symptoms. So we want to titrate them off that medication as well. If that doesn't work, we can give them a non-benzo anti-anxiety medication called Boost Bar. Boost Bar is really effective in helping to reduce someone's level of anxiety enough so that they're able to cope with what's going on and use their coping skills. So these medications often won't cure your anxiety, but it just reduces it enough that you have the focus and you have the control to implement coping skills. And coping skills are gonna be a really, really huge non-pharmacologic um, intervention. 
if somebody is having a panic attack or have panic level anxiety, we can describe them a benzodiazepine. So examples of this would be your Valium, Xanax, Clonopin, Ativan, or any barbiturates. These are highly addictive medications and they have very high street value. So they're often abused. So when we prescribe them, they're often prescribed for a small dose and as a PRN medication, we really only should be giving patients these benzodiazepines if they're having panic level anxiety. They are very fast acting. So they're used in very intense and distressed situations and they do have high withdrawal potential. So we see the same withdrawal with benzodiazepines that we would with alcohol withdrawal. And it can be deadly. The individual can have a lot of physical symptoms, seizures, delirium, um, and all of those other assessments that we talked about when we talked about alcohol withdrawal. And so we would actually treat that the same way we would treat alcohol withdrawal. Another thing to keep in mind is that if somebody is on a benzodiazepine and they're withdrawing off of it, it's going to cause rebound intense anxiety. Um, so we wanna be careful to monitor that. We also know that benzodiazepines can cause respiratory depression and sedation, especially if a dose is too large or if it's mixed with alcohol. So we really wanna monitor for those sedative effects. We wanna monitor for sleep apnea, low respirations, um, as well as educate our patients not to combine it with alcohol, take too much of it, or um, we want to also educate them not to operate any heavy machinery or do anything dangerous while sedated on that. So non-pharmacologically, like I said, we really want to encourage good coping skills. We wanna assess for the effectiveness of it. Is it appropriate? Is it helping them to adapt to new situations? As far as therapy technique goes, positive self-talk is a really beneficial one. And so this is planning and rehearsing positive coping statements by memory or cue cards. So some people might write on their mirror, you're going to have a great day today. So then every time they wake up in the morning and they go to brush their teeth, they look in the mirror and they can repeat that. You're going to have a great day today. Um, some people will write things down on like an index card and they'll say, um, you know, you've got this. And then whenever they feel stressed or they feel that they can't do anything, they can pull that index card out and read that and remind themselves um, to think positively about that situation. And in turn, that helps them to have the confidence that they need to take on whatever task is causing them stress. Distraction is another beneficial um, therapy strategy. So this could be by doing single repetitive activities so that is why counting sheep before bed is always kind of recommended to help with insomnia because it's focusing on that repetitive um, technique and that distraction technique. So things like counting is really beneficial. That's why, you know, sometimes when people get overwhelmed, they say count to 100 and they can focus on counting. It helps them to control their breathing and calm down. Another thing too is you can um, use distraction techniques like putting a rubber band around your wrist. And anytime you start getting stressed or think that anxiety provoking thought, you can snap the rubber band and it causes a pain response that helps in turn for you to stop focusing on that negative thought. Um, reframing is another technique. And this is when we change the way we view a situation, an event, or a person. Breathing control is probably one of the most effective ones, especially when we're talking about panic level anxiety. So breathing control is helping to control our breaths and it's involving deep breaths where you inhale deeply through the nose enough so that your abdomen rises out and then exhaling through the mouth. So when you're inhaling, it should take about five seconds. It's helpful to hold for about two and then exhale through the lips for about two. While doing this, you're focusing on relaxing your muscles. We want to encourage them to do a few breaths and then to breathe normally for a little bit and then take it back up because if they do this deep breathing too long, um, it can cause that lightheadedness. So about every 10 breaths, we recommend that they take about a 30 second break from the deep breathing. Um, this is going to be really, really, really effective in stopping a panic attack because remember we talked about the symptoms of a panic attack and how a lot of it is caused by that hyperventilation and that acid-base imbalance in the blood. So what we 
often will do is if someone is starting to have a panic attack, we want to implement this breathing control straight away. The one issue with that is if someone is having a panic attack, they're not going to have the focus to be able to do the deep breathing. So we want to talk them through it. But when we talk them through it, we have to be very clear and very direct because they're going to have that hyper focus on their anxiety. So they're not super aware of their surroundings and they may not be able to follow you if you're giving a long winded description of the deep breathing. So you just literally want to say, breathe in, hold your breath, breathe out. Another way that you can stop um, the hyperventilation, if it's appropriate, so the patient can't be an aspiration risk or anything, but if you have them take a sip of water, it forces them to kind of stop their breathing and restart at a normal rate. Um, and that's really effective for patients that are very upset or maybe having severe anxiety. The next technique is thought blocking. And so this is um, where we identify negative thoughts or anxiety provoking thoughts and that we train ourselves to stop those thoughts before they finish. So again, the rubber band technique would be a good one for this. Another one is using a cue card where you write down the negative thought and then on the back you change it to a positive thought. And then if you start experiencing that thought, you start reading the cue card and flip it over really quick and read the positive one so that your mind starts to associate that thought with the positive thought. Another therapy technique that we can do is called implosive therapy. So this is when we identify something that causes severe anxiety. It's mostly used for phobias. And we present that patient with imagery of that phobia until they're desensitized to that and they experience less anxiety from it. Once they have less anxiety from the imagery of that um, anxiety inducing stimuli, then we can actually, if it's safe, expose them to that object or event and then teach them anxiety reduction techniques. So another way that we call this is flooding. So the flooding is the process of the patient becoming desensitized to stimuli based on implosive therapy. Um, so this is a terrible example of it, but the one example that I think of is on Mori once. There had highlighted a bunch of individuals with phobias and someone had an intense phobia to peaches where they couldn't eat peaches, they couldn't be by peaches, they couldn't see peaches because it really stressed them out. So what they did is they um, you know, brought out peaches and the patient, or not the patient, but the guests on the show ended up running away. And then they just had people throughout the studio holding peaches, exposing that individual to the peaches um, so that they became desensitized to it. This particular example, they didn't do it in quite a healthy way. It was quite aggressive and obviously for ratings on the TV, but that's an example of the flooding and the implosive therapy. Similarly, we can have systematic desensitization. So this is a form of therapy where the individual makes a list of anxiety provoking situations and categorizes them from the least anxiety to the most anxiety. And then what we do is we expose them to the thing that causes them the least anxiety and as they experience mild anxiety, we can teach them relaxation techniques, coping skills, anxiety reduction techniques until they become desensitized to that particular situation. Then we move them up to the next level of anxiety and we do the same thing. And we do that until they are mostly desensitized and trained to cope with anxiety so that that particular thing that causes very, very severe anxiety is more manageable to them. They're better able to cope with the anxiety that that causes, but they're also a little desensitized to the experience of anxiety. So that particular thing doesn't cause as severe of a reaction. Another thing that we can do is panic control treatment. And I think this is one of the coolest treatments. Basically what this is, is you invoke a panic sensation to the individual. Usually it's done through exercise. So you'll run on a treadmill because running on a treadmill induces very similar feelings to panic attack. As you're running, you're feeling short of breath, you're breathing heavier, your muscles are starting to tense up, your heart rate increases. Um, I don't know about everyone, but when I run, sometimes I start to feel like, oh my gosh, I can't do this. I'm dying. My chest might hurt. Um, so it's a lot of those similar physical symptoms of anxiety and a panic attack. So what happens is they have you run on the treadmill and then they walk you through different body relaxation 
techniques. So as you're running, they may say, okay, now breathe in through your nose, breathe out through your mouth and work on those deep breathing techniques. Or they may say, okay, as you're running, try and relax your left bicep muscle. Okay, now try and move that relaxation down to your lower arm. All right, now release the grip on your hands. Okay, feel that lightness in your muscles. So they work through those different relaxation techniques so that when someone starts to have a panic attack, their body is already trained on how to um, relax in those situations. So I think that's really cool. Um, another thing that we can do is interoceptive conditioning. This is very similar to classical conditioning where you teach a patient to change a negative association to a positive one. So um, you have to do a lot of behavioral analysis in order to do that. And individuals that get interoceptive conditioning often have, feel low control over their environment. So it's observing their behaviors and helping them to reframe their interpretation of situations and their environment to feel like they have more control. Another thing that's gonna be really helpful is family interventions. Um, it's really important to educate family on anxiety because a lot of times if family members don't understand anxiety or they don't understand why someone's having such a strong fear or reaction to something that may seem trivial or minimal, they can often be very frustrated with that fam family member and that can lead to unsupportive comments and unsupportive behaviors. So if we educate the family on helpful things to say and different techniques to improve their focus and encouragement of that individual's use of coping skills, the better outcomes our patients will have. Lastly, we have our lifestyle changes. Um, we kind of talked about the importance of diet, exercise, sleep patterns. So all of those are going to be opportunities for intervention. We can also help our patients to become more organized and more um, structured by getting on a more standard schedule. That really seems to be very effective in helping to treat anxiety as well. Also setting daily goals and rewarding yourself when you reach those goals can be very helpful in reducing anxiety as well. So now we're going to get into the different types of anxiety. Um, there's general anxiety disorder, panic disorder, phobias, and social anxiety disorder. So generalized anxiety disorder is the main type of anxiety that a lot of people experience. Based on the DSM-5, the criteria has to occur for at most days for about six months, and it's often excessive worrying or anxiety. So some people may call these individuals like a worry wart, or they may always seem anxious about something, but they don't necessarily know what the cause of that anxiety is. It's often difficult for them to control their worry, and they often have to have at least three of the following symptoms with their anxiety. Restlessness, um, easily fatigued, difficulty concentrating or their mind going blank, irritability, muscle tension, and sleep disturbances. A lot of times the anxiety or worry or physical symptoms of anxiety can interfere with socialization, work functioning, and other areas of functioning. The individual may feel frustrated or disgusted with their life or themselves, so they may feel hopeless. They may remember a time in their life where they didn't feel anxious at all or were not expecting the worst of things. They're often called chronic worriers. Onset is insidious and anxiety can kind of come and go. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, treatment for this is going to be use of antidepressants, anti-anxiety medications, deep breathing, counseling, and lifestyle changes. Now we have panic disorder. So we talked a little bit about the experience of a panic attack, but this is extreme overwhelming form of anxiety when an individual um, either has a perceived or a real life threatening situation. Um, it's often associated with phobias, which are irrational fears of objects, persons, or situations that lead to avoidance. Panic disorder is chronic with several exacerbations and remissions. And based on the DSM-5, the criteria is recurrent and unexpected panic attacks. Um, and over the course of a month, they will also have either persistent worry or concern about having a panic attack, or they'll have a maladaptive change in their behavior to try and avoid another panic attack. Um, risk factors for developing panic disorder is being of the age of 20 to 24, being female, having low socioeconomic status, being widowed, separated, or divorced, 
being Caucasian, having a family history of panic disorders, having substance use or using stimulants, smoking, having an early life trauma, um, or having comorbidities of vertigo, cardiac disease, GI disorders, asthma, and cigarette related illnesses. Um, the main theory behind how panic attacks start is that there's some type of abnormality in our fear network. So our fear network is um, the amygdala, the hippocampus, the thalamus, the midbrain, the pons, the medulla, and the cerebellum, and how it all works together to form our flight or fight response. So there's some theory that there's an abnormality in that region. Another theory is that the body has abnormal serotonin and norepinephrine levels. Um, another theory is that the individual has increased GABA. And so that's why we often see that panic attacks can develop into seizures because remember seiz the seizure threshold is also determined by GABA. So if we have abnormal GABA levels that can lead to the correlation between panic disorder and seizures. Um, also, it can be caused by classical conditioning or individuals that have a low sense of control with their environment. Um, we already talked about the different symptoms of a panic attack. Like I said, it can be anywhere from 30, 10 to 30 minutes or five to 30 minutes, but it often peaks at 10 minutes. The symptoms again are heart palpitations, chest discomfort, rapid pulse, nausea, dizziness, sweating, parathesia, trembling and shaking, feeling suffocated or short of breath, having disorganized thinking, irrational thoughts, depersonalization, decreased ability to concentrate and feelings of doom, death, or going crazy or losing control. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this earlier when we talked about the symptoms or not, but a lot of times it can mimic a heart attack. So most individuals that go to the ER thinking they're having a heart attack are actually having a panic attack. Um, also anxiety attacks or panic attacks are very similar to asthma attacks as well. Um, so we do recommend that if the patient has difficulty controlling their breathing or can't focus on deep breathing techniques to give them a paper bag to breathe in and out of. And that helps to kind of circulate that CO2 to prevent that progression into seizures. Um, as far as treatment for panic disorder goes, like I said, we would give them a prescription for a benzodiazepine. And that tends to be the main treatment for an individual during a panic attack. Then we have our phobias. So phobias, as we mentioned, are irrational fears of objects, people, situations that cause avoidance of that particular um, thing that causes fear. You can have a phobia to anything, but the most common pho phobias are agoraphobia, which is fear of leaving the house, standing in line, being in crowds, being in enclosed spaces or using public transportation. And the main thing is that individuals feel that if they do these things, that bad things may happen and that escape from that bad situation will be impossible. So that leads to the avoidance of leaving the house or standing in line or being in an enclosed space. Um, there's also a lot of specific phobias. Um, the most common ones are phobias to animals like snakes, insects, spiders. Um, phobias to heights, phobias to storms, phobias to blood or injections, STDs, communicable diseases, things like that. Claustrophobia is the specific anxiety or phobia related to small and enclosed spaces. Um, we do know that phobias often peak in childhood and then we see another peak in the early 20s. It does affect women more than men. And what it does is it can actually cause a strong vasovagal response. So the individual can have, um, you know, really high heart rate and a tank in blood pressure, and it can cause the feelings of faintness. Um, treatment for phobias, as I kind of mentioned already, is exposure therapy, improving an individual's functioning and improving their social relations so that they have more support to not avoid those situations or behaviors. Then we have social anxiety disorder. So social anxiety disorder is fear and anxiety about attending a social setting where the individual is under scrutiny or may be judged or evaluated. They worry that that anxiety provoking situation will cause them to be negatively reviewed. Um, so what they do is they avoid social situations. The fear is often out of proportion to the threat and it can cause great distress and impairment and social and occupational functioning. Um, with this, 
individuals with social anxiety disorder have a lot of difficulty with dating, with doing presentations, um, having intimate relationships. So they often may lack academic achievement and socialization in early childhood. And one theory as to why this is caused is that it may be due to low dopamine levels. So the main treatment for social anxiety, ex social anxiety disorder is exposure therapy. Um, the Toastmasters Club is one form of exposure therapy that has been created specifically for social anxiety disorder. And this is when people all with social anxiety disorder meet together in a safe space and they practice public speaking skills. And they do that by having a rotation of who's leading the meeting so that everyone's kind of forced to put themselves in the position where the tension's on them, where the scrutiny is on them, and they help each other work through their anxiety experiences so that they're exposed to those situations and know that not every time that they go in front of public are they going to be negatively evaluated. So another anxiety-related disorder is obsessive-compulsive disorder. So when we talk about obsessive compulsive disorder, it's important to understand obsessions and compulsions. So an obsession is a frequent intrusive and upsetting thought. It can be caused by images that cause anxiety and distress, and they're often unwanted by the person. The person cannot control those thoughts. They're inconsistent with the person's usual thought patterns. And the most common obsessive thoughts that we see in OCD are germs and fear of getting sick from those germs, having an intruder, having insecurities and doubts about different things, especially body image, thoughts of violence, thoughts of sex, thoughts of death, and obsession with patterns. Compulsions, on the other hand, are repetitive behaviors that are performed in a ritualistic fashion with the goal of preventing or relieving that anxiety and distress that's caused by the obsessive thoughts. So the obsession is the thoughts that the individual is having that's causing anxiety, whereas the compulsion is the action that they do to try and reduce the obsessions. Um, the compulsions are not necessarily pleasurable to the individual, and they may have a good understanding that it may be odd or strange, or it might not make sense in the bigger picture and realistically. Um, and we do know that compulsions generally match the obsession. So for example, if someone has a lot of obsessive thoughts about germs, the compulsion would be to often clean or wash their hands. If they have obsessive thoughts about an intruder, they may often lock their doors. Um, if they have obsessive thoughts about their insecurities or their body image, they may look in the mirrors often. If they have obsessive thoughts about patterns, they may organize a lot, things like that. So the DSM-5 criteria for obsessive compulsive disorder is that their obsessive obsessions and compulsions have to take up more than one hour of a day, and it has to cause significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, and other areas of functioning. The clinical course of OCD is that the average onset is about 19 years old and it occurs gradually. So it doesn't happen all at once. It kind of develops over a sense of time. Men tend to have earlier onset. Women tend to have more cleaning and organizing compulsions. And it's very difficult to diagnose in children. So we say that the onset is typically 19 years old, but there's a lot of research out there and theories that it's actually a lot earlier because children often have magical thinking, fantasy play. They do those compulsive things just naturally, like avoiding sidewalk cracks or, you know, touching everything that they pass by and everything. So it's really hard to tell if a child has OCD or if it's just typical childlike behaviors. Um, we do know that having OCD can often lead to severe anxiety. It can lead to decreased self-esteem as the individuals may become shameful, disgusted or embarrassed with themselves, and it has very high stress levels. So we do know that suicide behaviors are very, very high in individuals that have OCD. Risk factors for the development of OCD is a family history, having an infection with beta hemolytic streptococci as a child, being young, divorced, or separated, being unemployed, being Caucasian, substance abuse, having a dependent personality type, 
and typically having a somatic and paranoid predisposition anyways. Um, we do know that OCD is often comorbid with Tourette syndrome, bipolar disorder, depression, psychothymic disorder, panic disorder, mood and eating disorders, and impulsive control disorders. We do know that because a lot of individuals have very somatically focused um, obsessions and compulsions, they do often seek treatment and screenings quite a bit for things like AIDS, cancer, heart attacks, STDs, when they really don't have any symptoms of it. As far as the etiology goes, like I said, there is believed to be a genetic component to it. Um, there's also a theory that there's hyperactivity of the orbital frontal cortex, the cingulated cortex, and the caudate nucleus. There's also belief that it may be caused from increased cerebral glucose metabolism, low serotonin levels, or it could be a response to isolation. Um, so when we're assessing obsessive compulsive disorder, first and foremost, we want to assess, do they have any of those comorbidities that we talked about? Um, with the obsessions and compulsions, we wanna assess the duration of those. What are the triggers? How does it interfere with their daily life? Do they attempt to stop it at all? What type of interventions have they tried? We're going to assess things like their skin integrity, especially if they have the compulsive behavior where they're frequently washing their hands. Um, so we wanna encourage use of hand lotion. We wanna assess for any lesions or dry skin. Um, we're gonna to want to assess for arthritis, especially if they frequently clean, they can have things like carpal tunnel syndrome or arthritis. We're gonna assess their speech patterns. There are different scales like the Y box and the Maudsley Obsessive Compulsive Inventory Scales. We're going to assess safety. Like I mentioned, they are high risk for suicidal behaviors and self-harm. We're going to assess any family interactions. A lot of times individuals with OCD tend to remain single because they have the fear of germs that can be associated with intimacy and they may have paranoia about communicable diseases. Um, but if they are in relationships, for example, Howie Mandel, it may cause them to live apart from their family. So he actually has another house on the same property. It can really impair family relationships and affection towards one another. So we wanna assess for all that. And then we wanna assess for any substance abuse. As far as interventions go, we do want to give them time to complete their rituals, but we want to hold them accountable to staying on schedule. So if we know that someone has to wash their hands for an hour in the morning, we would want them to wake up an hour earlier so that they don't miss any group therapy, breakfast, anything like that. Um, we do know that being unable to finish their thoughts or finish their compulsion can increase anxiety and frustration, and we want to help them to cope with it rather than cause further anxiety and frustration. We do, however, even though we want to allow them to complete those rituals, but we want to try and distance the obsessive thoughts from the compulsion. So even though we're still gonna allow them to complete those rituals, we may say, okay, next time you have this obsessive thoughts, we're gonna set a timer and you have to wait five minutes before you do your compulsion. So let's just use hand washing as example. So they wait five minutes, they realize that they can handle it, they find the coping skills for those five minutes. Then after they get used to that, we can say, okay, now you have to wait 30 minutes and you set the timer for 30 minutes. Okay, now you have to wait an hour. And eventually in doing this, you're separating those obsessive and compulsive um, components so that when they have those obsessive thoughts, they've tra trained themselves to not have to do the compulsions as frequently. So it doesn't become as distressing and interfering to their life and it helps them to cope better with those thoughts. We always want to demonstrate sympathy and empathy. We want to be calm and non-authoritative. We do want to help them to focus on the physical consequences of the compulsion. We can teach them those thought stopping techniques that we talked about earlier, as well as relaxation exercises and improved sleep. We can help them with that cognitive restructuring that we talked about. Um, we can do exposure and response prevention. So this is when the person is exposed to a situation and an object known to increase anxiety, but then they're asked to refrain from those ritualistic behaviors to extinguish it. So that's kind of similar to what I said, where we're distancing the um, obsessive, obsessive thoughts and compulsive behaviors. 
We can actually do ECT for OCD. It's bound to be effective in that. We can perform psychosurgery, radiation therapy, and deep brain stimulation. Um, that's obviously a very restrictive measure. So it's one of the last interventions that we would do. And as far as medications go, we're going to prescribe an antidepressant, um, especially our MAOIs and our SSRIs. One thing about using the antidepressants is we often give it at a much higher dose than we would in depression or anxiety. Because we're giving it at such a high dose and because these individuals are already at such a high risk for suicidal behaviors, it's especially important that we monitor these patients for suicidal behaviors when starting that antidepressant. Another obsessive compulsive related disorder, so this isn't obsessive compulsive disorder, but it is related, is trichotillomania. So trichotillomania is the pulling out of hair, eyebrows, and eyelashes as an attempt to decrease any distress or anxiety. This can cause distress and lack of functioning. It's very common in early childhood, typically age five or less, but we do see another peak around adolescence. Sometimes the individuals may eat their hair. So if this is the case, we want to assess for hairballs, which can cause decreased absorption of nutrition. So they may have extreme weight loss and malnutrition. It can also cause severe stomach pain. Um, we also want to assess their culture because pulling out hair can be culturally acceptable in certain cultures. So we would only want to diagnose someone with trichotillomania if the behavior is outside of their cultural norms. To treat this, we would give them an antipsychotic, an antidepressant, cognitive behavioral therapy, hair reversal training, and possibly hair plugs. Another related disorder is excoriation disorder. And this is recurrent skin picking that results in skin lesions with the attempt to stop an inability to do so. More commonly, they'll pick at the skin on their face, their arms, or their hands. And we want to make sure that we're assessing for any self-harming behavior because excoriation disorder is not an attempt to harm themselves. Um, so we want to rule out that it's self-mutilation or a suicidal gesture and that it's really just an anxiety related thing where they're picking at their skin. To treat excoriation disorder, we give them Lamictal. And remember Lamictal is um, used as a mood stabilizer in bipolar disorder. And it is associated with Stevens-Johnson syndrome. So you wanna make sure that you're monitoring for any symptoms of that. Another related disorder is hoarding disorder. So hoarding disorder is persistent difficulty discarding or parting with possessions. They feel the need to save these items out of distress, um, not because of value. It's often things that aren't very valuable at all. It can cause an accumulation of items that can congest living areas and can compromise um, the intended use of that space, which can often lead to a, um, a public health safety issue, especially if they have like a lot of boxes and things, those boxes can fall on them. It can lead to animals living in their home, different things like that. Um, it can cause severe distress and impairment. The risk factors for it is there is a genetic component. It is more common in Native Americans. It's more common in individuals greater than the age of 45. It's more common in individuals that have only a high school education, that are widowed, separated, or divorced, or that live in rural communities. Um, again, this can pose a significant public and personal health threat. So um, a lot of times we do have to do interventions on those levels. And then we have body dysmorphic disorder, which a lot of people associate with eating disorders because it can lead to an eating disorder. But body dysmorphic disorder is actually an anxiety related disorder and not an eating disorder. So the DSM-5 criteria for body dysmorphic disorder is that it's preoccupation with one or more perceived deficit or flaw in their physical appearance that is not observable or only slightly observable to others. They often do repetitive behaviors or mental acts in response to those fears and those uh, perceived flaws. And their preoccupation with it can cause distress and impairment in social, occupational, and other areas of functioning. Generally, this does begin in adolescence. There is a 60% comorbidity between body dysmorphic disorder and anxiety disorder. 
and it can lead to risk for eating disorders and depression. The suicide attempt rate for individuals with body dysmorphic disorder is very high. It's between 22 and 24%. So lastly, I wanna talk about somatic symptom and dissociative disorders. So somatic symptom disorders are the manifestation of physical distress um, in response to their psychological experiences. So individuals may experience stomach aches, headaches, and a wealth of other physical symptoms because they're not able to psychologically cope with an experience that they had or what they're experiencing. So somatization as a psychosomatic process. Um, so psychosomatic is the physical or psychological origin of a disease process. The physical manifestation is evident. So they do really have these symptoms, but there's no biological basis. So it's attributed to being psychological. Um, and we don't want to say that the physical symptoms are all in their head, but we rather want to say that it's unexplained. We do find that somatic symptoms often incur in individuals that have experienced severe traumas or have very high stress. Um, and one theory as to why these develop is the possibility of knowing that medical diagnoses are more acceptable in society and bring about less stigma than individuals that have severe emotional distress or um, mental illness during times of trauma. So the first type of disorder is somatic symptom disorder. The DSM-5 criteria is that they have to be symptomatic for at least six months with one or more somatic symptoms that are distressing or impair functioning. They often have to have excessive thoughts, feelings, and behaviors related to that somatic symptom, and it can be manifested by one or more of disproportionate and persistent thoughts about the seriousness of the symptoms, persistent high level of anxiety about the symptoms, or excessive time and energy devoted to the symptoms. Um, the symptoms are often dynamic, so they can change. They can grow in severity. They can change body symptoms. Um, it can increase rates of unemployment because the symptoms are seen as too physically severe to function at work. These individuals often have a lot of healthcare providers because they're trying to find out what is wrong and they're trying to find the medications that they need and they wanna be taken seriously. So as healthcare providers, we do wanna take them seriously. But what happens is they're prescribed these medications or we can't find any biological basis for it. So then the doctor doesn't give them what they need and then the patient becomes more frustrated and goes to another doctor. Or maybe they prescribe a medication and that medication doesn't work because there's no biological basis for the symptoms that they're feeling. So it can be very, very, very frustrating and discouraging for individuals that have it. Um, they often have a significant medical and surgical history. We can do a MAP screening here in Michigan to identify where the patient has gotten prescriptions from so we can see how much variety of different providers that they have. Um, and as much as it can be incredibly frustrating for the patient, it can also be very frustrating for healthcare providers, especially because the patient may report the same symptoms repeatedly um, and they may not be satisfied with the care and the treatment that they get. So it can be very discouraging for a healthcare worker that may be trying to work hard to try and help them and figure out what's going on. Some healthcare workers see it as a cry for attention. Um, and some healthcare workers may feel that the patient acts sicker than what they are. So they may feel that the patient is exaggerated or dramatic, but we really have to be careful not to think that way because like I said, these individuals are truly experiencing these symptoms um, and it can be very, very, very distressing in them. So generally, um, these disorders are not diagnosed until adolescence, but we can see it in childhood. Like I said, we can see headaches, abdominal pain, fatigue, nausea. They may avoid wanting to go to school um, because it may be stressful or traumatic for them so that they might say, oh, well, my stomach hurts. Um, in adolescence, we find that those symptoms are more common to be pelvic or abdominal abnormalities or menstruation abnormalities. Um, so as far as the etiology goes, we do find that this occurs more commonly in families that have a lot of chaos going on. Um, it's more common in individuals that have difficulty expressing their emotions, as well as people that have alexthymia personality trait, which is difficulty identifying or expressing emotion, 
preoccupation with external events and more concrete and externally oriented thinking. Risk factors are for individuals less than 30 years of age, having a family history, being easily emotionally distressed, having heightened arousal, having a severe history of trauma, especially sexual trauma, being of Chinese or Latin American origins, and having a comorbidity of anxiety, depression, panic disorder, mania, social phobias, OCD, psychotic disorders, and personality disorders. So when we're assessing our patients with somatic symptom disorder, we want to assess the most, or we want to assess their um, physical symptoms. So we are going to do a full physical assessment. The most common physical symptoms that we see with somatic symptom disorder are dysmenorrhea, feeling like they have a lump in their throat, vomiting, shortness of breath, burning or pain in different organs, pain in their limbs, amnesia, like I said, that headache, stomach ache, things like that. More uncommon symptoms that we can see, but we do see are things like paralysis, um, urinary retention, confusion, things like that. So we want to, in addition to doing their physical health assessment, their health history, we're going to assess their sleep functioning, their activity level, how it impacts their sexual functioning, what types of medications they take, how many hospital visits they've had, we're going to assess for symptoms of depression, hopelessness, body image changes, cognition. We're going to assess for a history of abuse or trauma. Um, we do know that people often have increased symptoms around the anniversary of an event or trauma, so we want to assess for that. We want to assess for any substance use, especially overuse of oxalytics or benzodiazepines. We want to assess their social support. These individuals are often unemployed because they're on disability. They may have multiple changes in jobs or absences in the workplace, and family might have tense or frustrated relationships with the individual. So our interventions are first and foremost to shift the feel or shift the focus from their physical feelings to their emotional feelings so that we can help them to cope with whatever trauma and whatever psychological distress they're experiencing to help reduce those physical symptoms. So generally, we want to centralize healthcare to one provider, and that provider needs to show trust and concern. Um, they also should use increased use of complementary and alternative medicines. So we want to treat comorbid comorbidities conservatively using least intrusive approaches, because we don't want to force any surgeries or medications on someone that's not going to be helpful for them. We can provide them with cognitive behavioral therapy, which can help to refocus um, them on their emotional distress rather than their physical symptoms. For pain management, we want to focus on complementary or alternative medicines. For exercise, having a daily routine helps to improve the illness and improve their sleeping abilities. We can do nutritional interventions, relaxation techniques like biofeedback and stress management. If they do need medications, we can provide them an antidepressant, um, especially that SSRI or an MAOI, in particular Nardil, um, is really effective in treating headache-related somatic symptoms. We can use Boost Bar for anxiety. Some people might be described an antipsychotic. And then we want to manage the providers, any overprescriptions and side effects. For group therapy, we can help them on focusing their behavior changes, as well as developing coping skills. And it can also help the patient with their social skills and feeling connected. We can give them individual counseling and help improve any social support. Then we have illness anxiety disorder, which is formally called hypochondria. The DSM-5 diagnosis for anxi illness anxiety disorder is preoccupation with having acquired an illness. So their somatic symptoms aren't actually present, but the individual is so focused on developing them that it causes high levels of anxiety in regards to their health. Um, contrary to popular belief, individuals with illness anxiety disorder often avoid healthcare or they don't see doctors because they're so anxious about being told that they have something wrong or that they have the disorder. So they do have excessive health related behaviors, but they also have a maladaptive avoidance of getting healthcare when they actually need it. Um, with illness anxiety disorder, they can often misinterpret body sensations 
and it's more common if they've had a serious illness in childhood or if they had a loved one that developed a serious illness in childhood. Then we have conversion disorder. So the DSM-5 diagnosis for conversion disorder is that they have one or more symptoms of altered voluntary motor or sensory function symptoms. There's incompatibility between the symptoms and the recognized neurological or medical condition. And the deficit can cause significant distress and malfunction in that individual. It can often be manifested as impaired balance, paralysis, urinary retention, difficulty swallowing, aphonia, loss of touch, blindness, deafness, hallucinations, and seizures. The most common are paralysis and urinary retention. So we have to possibly straight cath our patients every so often, make sure that we're doing our bed turns, helping them with um, active and passive range of motion movements and things like that. When we're testing individuals for why they're experiencing paralysis or any of these other symptoms, all the tests do return negative. Um, and so we really want to make sure that we're focusing on their emotional feelings and helping them to change that focus. Um, the most common risk factor is childhood trauma. One thing that I do want to say about this is these individuals truly experience it. So they may have paralysis. They're not able to move their legs. They're not able to walk or anything. There's no biological reason for that. They've had no injury. They've had um, no development of illness. All of the tests come back negative, but they truly cannot move their, their limbs. So then what happens is, is they go through therapy and as their trauma lessens, they regain that ability. So it's a really interesting disorder and also very incredibly distressing for those patients. So we really want to make sure that we're focusing on being empathetic and encouraging for that patient. Um, so that's about it for conversion disorder. So this is a good slide that kind of compares the different types of somatic disorders. So that somatic symptom disorder or conversion disorder is they actually have the symptoms. Illness anxiety disorder is they're worried about developing their symptoms. And the next thing we're going to talk about is fictitious disorder, where they actually cause the symptoms on purpose. So fictitious disorder, formerly called Munchenhausen's, is when an individual intentionally causes illness or injury to themselves in order to receive attention. The DSM-5 diagnosis is that they have a falsification of physical or psychological signs or symptoms. The individual presents as ill, impaired, or injured, and the deceptive behavior is evident in the absence of obvious external rewards. So for example, they wouldn't do this to get time off of work or anything. Um, these individuals have a significant hospitalization history. This is different than malingering. So malingering is a concept that we use in psychiatric nursing when a patient um, creates symptoms to try and stay in the hospital longer. So this is different than that because that would be um, an external reward. They have you know, more time with treatment, more time with um, possibly food or a safe shelter, things like that. So it is different than malingering. Um, a lot of individuals with fictitious disorder also have pseudologia fantastica, which is when they have stories that are not improbable, but do contain a mixture of truths and falsehoods. Um, common ways that they may induce injury or illness is faking a fever. So they may place the thermometer in heat, spray water on their forehead. They can induce seizures through medications. They may inject bacteria in their wounds, or um, they may open up a wound to cause infection or lack of healing. They can use contaminated blood, urine, or other samples. They may inject anticoagulants or insulin. They can take an excessive amount of thyroid hormones to produce thyroid toxicosis. They can also inject allergens. They may take hallucinogens or other medications to induce hallucinations, delusions, cognitive dysfunctions, amnesia, memory loss, disassociation, pseudoparalysis, and pseudoblindness. The risk factors for fictitious disorder is being in your early 20s, being female, having a history of abuse, as well as a genetic component. Oftentimes they have comorbid mood disorders, personality disorders, and substance abuse disorders. 
The um, theories behind why it develops is that it could be a cry for attention during times of severe sexual trauma or marital distress. It could be a cry for help when a relationship ends. It's often described by some people as a dissociative or trance-like state. So some people do believe that it's actually not intentional in the sense that the individual is not aware that they're doing it. Um, others disagree with that. Another theory is that these individuals may lack family and friends, so they form relationships with healthcare workers to help expand their social network. Um, a lot of times, if this is the case, we do see that these individuals will switch healthcare workers and providers when their behaviors are confronted or when the illness is challenged. So we do want to make sure that we confront our patients in a supportive and effective way so that it doesn't cause them to leave our care. And it's really beneficial to centralize their care all in one facility. Um, as far as treatment goes, we want to make sure that we do really intense collaboration between medical, psychiatric, inpatient, um, psychiatric outpatient teams, and that all of them are frequently communicating with each other. As far as nursing considerations go, like I said, we want to monitor for multiple health care providers. We want to assess their need for attention and treat it in any way that we can. We also want to attend to any safety issues. So they're really at high risk for severe illnesses, accidental suicide, as well as inducing illnesses upon others, which is the next slide. Um, or, I'm sorry. Um, which is called fictitious disorder imposed on another um, or formerly known as Munchenhausen's by proxy. So this is when they inflict the injury on another individual in order to get attention. So they may induce seizures, poisoning, smothering, um, Individuals that are victims of fictitious disorder imposed on another have an increased risk of developing fictitious disorder. Um, and so we really want to make sure that we're assessing the safety of others as well. And that is it for the anxiety related disorders.